All right, let's get started, guys. So today's lecture, we're going to discuss uh, defenses for buffer overflows. So we're going to look at how do we uh, deal with buggy code and somehow make it slightly more secure, uh, despite it having some bu uh, buffer overflow vulnerabilities. So the sort of top-level story for what this lecture and what the paper you read is all about is that we're sort of reconciled to living in a world where we have this error-prone C code. And you guys are all familiar by now from lab one with buffer overflows, bugs. You know, in, bug, in lab one, we weren't particularly careful trying to avoid buffer overflows, so there's lots of them that you can find. But it's not sort of necessarily a thing we planted. It's really hard to avoid these kinds of bugs in C code, which is why they're so prevalent. So what do we do about all this buggy C code that you can, that an adversary can exploit? Well, one line of sort of approach might be to rewrite. So rewrite your code in some language that doesn't have memory management errors like C. So you might be able to rewrite it in maybe Rust or Go or, you know, pick lots of languages that have been developed since then that have some form of memory safety provided by the language itself. And you can still shoot yourself in the foot if you try hard, but it's much harder to do so. In C, uh, you have to be extremely careful in lots of places. So that's one approach, although not one that this paper is sort of exploring, mostly because they're sort of reconciled to, well, there's all this C code out there already, all these applications. Uh, they're not going to get rewritten immediately. Uh, Linux kernel is still written in C, even though it's like 13 years after this paper was written about Baggy and and no sign of changing to some other language wholesale anytime soon. Um, so it would be good to have some plan for protecting existing C code. One alternative, again, to protect existing C code might be to try to find or fix the bugs. So all these buffer overflows. And that's also a pretty good plan to the extent that it works. In fact, probably all these plans are reasonable, and you'll probably need all of them put together in practice. Um, we'll look later in the class at various techniques to find and fix all kinds of bugs in programs, including buffer overflows. That seems like a real issue, and people do this all the time. But the plan for this lecture, and this paper in particular, is really to sort of say that we do have these bugs, but the goal is to actually make them more difficult to exploit. or maybe prevent exploits for certain particular kinds of bugs. Um, it's really sort of reconciling that, well, we have this code, it is buggy, what do we do with that? And this paper, this baggy bounce paper, is really trying to address this question of how do you do something sensible with uh, a buggy C application. Make sense? Any questions about that? That's hopefully all reasonably clear. Feel free to ask questions through one of the TAs as well. So how are we going to defend ourselves against buffer overflow attacks? Well, here our goal really is to make the attacker's job, uh, job much harder. We don't have to be perfect. It's going to be impossible to really be perfect. You have to rewrite the application to be perfect. Um, but um, it's useful to understand what are the steps involved in an attack so that we can figure out where can we sort of make the attacker's job particularly difficult. So what does a typical buffer overflow attack look like? Well, there's really sort of you can think of it as having maybe three steps. One is you find some bug and that uh, you know lets you overflow a buffer. So some piece of code that writes past the end of an array and lets you corrupt some memory. And you've hopefully corrupted some memory that contains a pointer like a return address where the program is going to eventually jump to. But the first part is you just overflowed. Then later after the overflow. At some point, the program is going to jump to an address that was part of the overflow of your buffer. So jump to some program counter uh, from the, the adversary. And then the last part is, well, you've got to jump somewhere useful, so you've got to run some code from the attacker. So run the attacker's code. 
So these are roughly the steps you guys are doing in lab one. And most defenses try to make one of these things more difficult for the bad guy to do. Make sense? Questions about anything here? So we're going to try to look at a bunch of these defenses that people have deployed in practice, including baggy as uh, one scheme that's particularly clever and maybe somewhat more effective than others in some ways. Um, but good to get a sort of broad perspective of how you might be able to defend against these attacks. Make sense? Good. All right. So let's look at the simplest defense, probably, uh, that is deployed today. And that is non-executable stacks. So the idea here for this defense is to go after this last part of the attack, where the bad guy runs some code that they supplied. And the observation here is that in your application, you have your address space. And there's lots of stuff in your address space. There's probably a stack up here. Somewhere you have a heap of all your memory that you've malloced. Somewhere at the bottom, you probably have the executable code of your application itself. And in for sort of naive machines, you'd be able to jump to a program counter and start running code from there, even if that program counter went to somewhere on the stack. Right, if this is the PC chosen by attacker, well, there's some code on the stack, some machine instructions that the victim program is executing that uh, really shouldn't be running. Why are you running code from a stack? So that's one sort of invariant that this defense is trying to go after. There's no reason in most applications to be running code that's located on the stack. So the idea here is to actually get some support from hardware to mark various regions of memory in your process as being either executable or non-executable. So you might mark the stack as non-executable, the heap as non-executable, and the pages comprising the code are actually executable. The rule is going to be that the CPU, of course, only runs code from regions marked executable, and all other regions cannot be executed at all. So if you jump to an address here, the CPU throws an exception, stops your program. So at least the bad guy doesn't get to run arbitrary code they put on the stack there. Make sense? So I think in lab one, you guys even sort of build an attack like this. But then you can also bypass these defenses, right? This is not a perfect defense. An alternative plan that you guys also follow in lab one is instead to find some useful code down here. A little bit more tricky, so you now have to jump to well, first find some code down here that does what you want to do, and then jump there. And this might be easier or harder, depending on exactly the instructions that are there, what you want to do, et cetera. Um, but not a perfect defense, right? Like, can bypass it with enough effort and uh, a little bit of luck. But it's still useful in the sense that it does make the attack harder. And this is a pretty common theme for many of these defenses for buffer overflows that we're going to see here, is that they work to some extent. They make some things impossible to attack, some things you just need to find another way to attack it. But it all in all sort of builds up the complexity of attacks. And none of them are perfect, but taken together, they probably do make the world or computers more difficult to exploit. It's kind of a funny kind of a security measure. It's a little bit at odds with this black and white notion of security that we were talking about very early on in the class. Like, security, you only have to find one vulnerability. And to some extent, it's true, but maybe finding or exploiting this one vulnerability is going to be much more difficult, given all these defenses. So in practice, it does seem to add up to better security of some form. Make sense? Question back there. Ah, so you're asking, okay, what about attacks that over time, like a page used to contain code, then it's on the stack, then it's back to containing code. So that's a good way of thinking about it, man. It's like exactly the line of argument you should be having with an adversary or with like, you know, an exploit. Um, the way this defense works is actually at the level of virtual addresses rather than physical addresses. It's actually at the level of virtual address mappings. So if you unmap a page of memory from your address space, if you m-unmap it or you free it and give it back to the kernel, 
the page doesn't really have a notion of being executable or not executable at all. If it's gone from your address space, it's just not a page. And then when you map a new page into your address space, you're going to specify whether you want it to be mapped as an executable or non-executable page. So that way of implementing these non-executable or executable markings avoids being subject to that kind of a temporal attack potentially, or at least some sorts of these attacks. The other thing that really saves you is that in most applications, the code is more or less static. You load it once at program startup time, and you probably aren't going to load more code over time. Now, this is not true for some applications, like a web browser. You're going to generate executable code on the fly by translating JavaScript into x86. But browsers are like a fairly unique application in that regard, and other runtimes, perhaps. For many applications, the code on an application is static at startup, and you're not going to have a virtual address that used to be a code address switched to being data or vice versa. But I think it's a sort of a good, a good line of thinking to have. Like, what exactly is being guaranteed here? How do you bypass it? Absolutely. Question? I think, uh, so the question is, it seems so easy, one bit, Matt, wow, where was this bit before? What were they thinking? I think they were actually thinking that virtual memory is not really about defending against anything. These attacks weren't discovered, really, when virtual memory was first uh, being developed. And virtual memory was really developed to multiplex memory. That was the big deal. And maybe they needed some protection bits, like read and write bits, so that you could share the same code across many applications. So one copy of libc mapped everywhere. So having write protection bits in the page table was important, but didn't seem to matter at the time whether you would run it or not. The line of thinking probably would be, well, if you don't want to run it, don't jump there. Why would you jump there? So I think the kinds of threats you worry about and the kinds of properties you might want from hardware change over time quite a bit, like here. And nowadays, actually, modern Intel hardware has some bounce checking instructions that weren't there before. So uh, Intel realized that the kinds of checks that Baggy was doing is important. And Baggy is just sort of one system. It's a research prototype, I should say. It's not actually deployed literally, but it's influenced quite a number of systems. So I think Microsoft C compiler has something like Baggy. LLVM has something like Baggy called Address Sanitizer. Many, many systems have similar designs now in them. And now there's hardware support for doing a range check. It's like one instruction, check the range of this pointer. And you might ask, okay, well, why wasn't there before? Well, you know, it wasn't important. You, it wasn't a big performance overhead. So I think the, the expectations for hardware do change over time, and as a result, new features get added. All right, other questions, comments about this? All right, so that's one kind of a defense, and sort of shows the flavor of you know, being somewhat annoying to that attacker, if you will, but also uh, bypassable. So here's another class of defenses that's pretty widely used. I should say, these non-executable stacks, basically every machine you guys have, every cell phone, it's got some feature like this and uh, runs this NX defense. Another thing that uh, probably is on most programs you run these days is uh, stack canaries. So the idea here is to not go after this part of the attack, but to try to go after the second step of jumping to the PC supplied by the attacker. So how do we prevent this jump from happening? Maybe we have overflowed the buffer, but we want to prevent the jump. So the idea there is to sort of look at the stack layout that you're likely to have. And uh, you know, from lab one, probably you guys remember, there's a return address somewhere in the stack. And then if you look further down, there's your saved RBP frame pointer. And then there's all the local variables that you might have. Oh, okay. If you have a buffer of some sort, well, it's going to go here, and you can overflow it up here. So the idea with stack canaries is to put something on the stack right here between buffers you might overflow and the sensitive return address. This thing is often called a canary. And it's a value that's going to be put there when the function starts running. And when we try to return from the function, before we look at the return address, which maybe got corrupted somehow by a buffer overflow, we're going to check if the canary is the same or not. And the thinking here is that, well, if the bad guy overflows this buffer and runs it up here and corrupts the return address, they must have corrupted the canary along the way. 
So that would be a way to detect that something bad has happened without jumping to the return address yet. So loosely speaking, the way this works is, you know, you have some function here, you have some code in the function, and what the compiler is going to do is, you're not going to have to do anything to your function at all. What the compiler does when it compiles your code is that the compiler is going to sort of insert some extra checks or instructions into the generated code for your function. So it's typically called instrumentation. And what the compiler is going to do is put a little statement up front at the very beginning of the function when it starts running to set the canary on the stack. So when you call a function, you're here on the stack. The function first pushes a canary value, then does everything else it would have normally done. And then after the whole function is done running, you know, did whatever it is, maybe overflowed the buffer, maybe not, it doesn't matter. We're going to check the canary. And this is going to be done by the compiler. That's a nice thing because it means that the programmer can't screw up, in a sense. Uh, they can't forget this check. The compiler is going to put this check in every single function. And if the canary doesn't match the value that we put there before, the compiler is going to cause the program to stop running right there. Now, this is preferable to running some code from the adversary because I guess crashing seems better than allowing the adversary to take over your application. At that point, something has gone wrong. You probably can't really recover and run the program normally from that point, but at least we can prevent any further damage by exiting if the canary doesn't match. That make sense? Questions about this sort of canary style attack? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you could do all kinds of stuff here. So if there was some other bug here that wasn't a buffer overflow, you could totally you know, take advantage of it and whatever. And if it doesn't involve returning from the function, you could even overflow the canary. The only thing that sort of the canary prevents is a connection between some overflow right here in the code and the implicit jump to the return address. You can do whatever you want in the code, but if you mess up the return address, the hope is you'll screw up the canary and you can't get to that ret instruction that jumps to your address. Yeah? Yeah, so good question. Okay, like, yeah, how about we don't corrupt the canary? That would be great as an attacker. So how do you do this? I guess it depends really on what this canary is. So if this canary was a value the attacker knew, well, you could probably just send the canary with your overflow and put the same value in the canary place. So in order for this to work well, you probably need the canary to be something that the adversary can't guess or can't supply in the overflow at all. So that's a tricky thing. So the, the way that's usually done is by setting the canary to be some kind of a random value. So when the program starts, the first thing it does is like generates a random number that's going to be used for the canary. And then every time it does any canary operation, it refers to this number and puts it on the stack or checks against it. So this way, because it's random, hopefully the bad guy can figure out what it is. Maybe, right? Like, okay, but you should have more questions. Like, okay, why can't I guess it? Maybe I can just try lots of times, or maybe I can get a stack dump from somewhere. Like if there's a buffer over read instead of an overwrite, maybe I can get some application to dump me some extra stack bytes. Then maybe you should observe the canary from the stack. Once you know the canary, then you can overflow and supply it. So you know, it's not perfect, right? If the adversary knows the canary, this doesn't work so well. But again, you know, you now have to chain many attacks or many parts of the many steps in order to make this attack successful. Question? Okay, so, so your point is on Linux, in, at least in some implementations of canaries, the canary itself might be somewhere up in the stack, like at the very beginning of the function. Well, that would be also really bad, indeed. <laughs> and indeed, some... I don't think this is the case on Linux now. I think on Linux there is some like thread local register that points to a structure, but it's not on the stack. I think it used to be on the stack. Uh, but yeah, if you sort of overflow, well, indeed, regardless of how you do it, maybe there's like multiple overflows, who knows? But if you can overflow this canary, but you don't know the real one, well, this check is going to look at some memory location to check whether the canary is right. Maybe you can overflow both this canary and the reference value. If you can somehow string together enough bugs to corrupt both this canary and the other one, and the reference value, well, you're also home free. So I think, indeed, 
you have to be careful. One approach might be to map that reference canary read-only so it's not corruptible, but I don't think Linux does that right now. I mean, all these sort of, you know, cat and mouse games you can keep playing, but indeed, this is the, indeed a good flavor of this sort of family of buffer overflow defenses is that, you know, not, not a satisfying crisp answer at any given point. <laughs> but it is useful. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Okay, all right. Any other questions, comments, thoughts about this? Uh, Kevin, yeah? Interesting question. How do you recover once you know your canary's been corrupted? Well, that sort of supposes there's some human here that's realizing the canary is corrupted. I think, uh, as a program, it doesn't really realize anything about the canary. So the thing that helps a little bit is that typically you choose a fresh canary every time you start a process. So if things go too badly and you end up restarting this process or reboot the machine, you're going to have fresh canaries. That helps a bit. But if you have some kind of a long-running process, the, well, the canary might not change that long-running process. Or if you have a process that starts and then forks, well, the forked threads or the forked processes must maintain the same canary because you could have entered a function in one thread, forked over, and returned in another process now. So all these processes that are forked from each other must share a canary. Otherwise, they can't return from functions that the parent called. So there's canary sharing. That's a bit of a problem. There's fancy schemes out there that try to patch in a canary value and, like, rewrite the stack, but uh, it gets quite messy and not clear if it's really worth the uh, extra defense at that point. But indeed, uh, yeah, important to think about where the canary reference comes from. Other questions, thoughts, comments? All right, so that's canary defenses. Another way to try to prevent buffer overflows is to make it difficult to figure out where to jump to. So sort of trying to get at the same issue as non-executable stacks, which is making it difficult for the adversary to know where to go to run some interesting code. Uh, and this is a address space uh, layout randomization. So defense idea, address space layout randomization, or often abbreviated ASLR. So the trick here that many systems play is that instead of always loading the code in exactly the same shape as we have in that NX diagram up there, you might actually switch things around. So you might actually put the stack in the middle, maybe you put the heap at some other random offset up there, maybe you shift the code around, and so on. And every time you run the program, the addresses are different. And the reason this might help is because every time the adversary attacks a process, they now need to figure out where to jump to. So here, if the loading is deterministic, like you guys have it in lab one, well, you can just figure out what the address is somehow, and then the attack will keep working. How you figure it out? Well, maybe you have an exact same copy of the server set up. Maybe you can somehow probe it, I don't know, get some debug dump, etc. But if you randomize it every process restart, this is going to be difficult to do. So the plan here, just to spell it out, is you're going to choose random addresses at exact time. Pretty much the same time you would sort of randomize your canary, for instance. When the program starts running, you're going to pick random locations for all this stuff to live in the address space. Make sense? Questions about this? How well does this work? How well would you expect it to work? Or is it difficult to bypass? Could you bypass it? Yeah? Okay, so your point is, well, you could learn the randomization, and then, well, it's game over, right? So, for example, if you accidentally get a, some kind of a debug stack trace from the server, then, well, that's, you have all the addresses of some code, at least, right there. Or if there's some other way in which you can learn the addresses of a particular running process, well, you can sort of de-randomize it that way as well. Other thoughts? Kevin? Or Sorry, let me, let me ask you. Yeah. Ah, speculative execution attacks, yeah. Uh, you know, everyone's excited about speculative execution attacks these days, yeah. So uh, we'll talk a, a lot about them in a couple of months towards the end of the class, but 
Indeed, if you're running on the same physical computer as the victim process, maybe you can do something with cache contents to figure out exactly where the code lies. We'll, we'll talk more about these attacks later. But indeed, there's various ways you might learn this stuff. Uh, Kevin, you had some Yeah, so SLR works at the level of virtual memory. So in physical memory, you know, your code lives in some DRAM pages over here. DRAM. And there's a page table that says, well, this virtual address goes to this DRAM location, this other DRAM location, etc. So when you start a new process, the operating system doesn't move your code around in physical memory. It sits where it is. But it sets up a new page table with a new set of addresses pointing to those same physical pages. So what's being randomized is indeed the virtual memory layout. And at the level of an application running on top of an OS kernel, the virtual memory is the only thing that matters. Applications have no way of referring to physical memory. So indeed, this does work for virtual memory mappings. Question? Ah, so another good point is ASLR right, needs some randomness. What about the very first process that starts when you boot up a computer? Maybe you don't have enough randomness yet at all, like the init process that runs right after the kernel boots. The kernel doesn't really have random numbers yet, maybe. It takes a while to like, collect randomness from somewhere. So indeed, maybe it's predictable. And people have actually exploited that for some systems, like especially an embedded system that's not like a laptop, but like a cheap, I don't know, Raspberry Pi or some other device that has a minimal kernel, with minimal devices. There's nowhere to get randomness from, really. So in that case, it might be that not just the first process, but even later processes start before the system has good randomness. So eh, this doesn't break, but you have predictable randomness, and then this, this defense isn't particularly useful. Good point. All right, so indeed, this is a useful, widely deployed defense. Pretty much every system out there, again, has ASLR, but uh, not perfect as we talked about. Uh, one other thing that it actually requires is needs the code to be relocatable. So not every application might be excited to discover itself somewhere at a random offset in the address space. So typically when you compile a program, you at least by default tell it, oh, you're going to run this address. You can expect to be there. Um, and uh, you really have to compile a program with some extra flags, which incurs some overhead, to allow the program to live anywhere in the address space that it wants, or the kernel chooses for it. And uh, the overhead comes from the fact that every time you want to jump to some address, you can't assume what that address is. You have to sort of indirect through some lookup table to figure out where the kernel mapped you. For some cases, this works out fine uh, with li little overhead. For other cases, there's more overhead being introduced. Make sense? Question? Okay, so the question is, how do you bypass NX stacks? Well, so the way you do it is you, or the most common way to do it, is that instead of sending shellcode to live on the stack like you guys are doing in the early parts of lab one, what you do is you actually find some code in the existing application binary or in libc or another code that the application has legitimately loaded into its address space, and you figure out how to use that existing code to do what you wanted. Like in the lab one example, you call unlink. So you need to figure out where unlink lives here and then you can just jump straight to unlink and get it to do whatever you wanted, as long as what you wanted was unlinking. If you want something fancy, well, now you have a more complicated job of finding whatever fancy stuff you wanted in here. There's more complications, of course, right, because you need to call unlink and have it unlink the right file, or if you want to call other functions, you have to pass the right arguments. You need to set up these arguments somehow, so you need to find some way to do that. It gets trickier, but indeed, that's the general plan is to reuse code from here in order to do a, run some malicious payload, so to say. Make sense? Question back there? Ah, so the question is, okay, so many programs are going to run, they're all going to load libc. Does libc run at the same address or different addresses in those processes? And the answer is actually you, every time you call exec, you get a new address for libc. So if you call exec, you're going to get your shared library load or LD Linux is going to generate a new random number and put the libc there. If you fork, now, sort of you have to preserve the memory layout across forks because that's the 
execution model that the application expects. But across execs, you get fresh randomness for all your relocatable shared libraries. Shared libraries are typically relocatable. The base application code is not always. So the dynamic library loader will relocate what it can. And for things that are not relocatable, it'll have to sort of pin it where it is. Any other questions? All right. So good to know about ASLR. Um, I guess I should have mentioned here's an amusing attack that people have mounted on ASLR is uh, in one thing that you guys haven't proposed yet as an attack is to fill the address space with lots of code. And it doesn't matter where you jump. Uh, so this works in particular for applications that do dynamic code generation like a web browser. So you might send a web browser lots and lots of JavaScript code, and it generates lots and lots of x86 code that corresponds to that JavaScript code. And now, if the address space is just full of 2 to the 32 bytes of generated x86, or close to it, then it doesn't really matter where you jump. You can jump anywhere. It's all going to land in some piece of your code. So now you just have to write code that doesn't matter where you jump in the middle of. It'll sort of execute something you care about. Kind of a funny model of execution, but there's all kinds of sort of subtle ways that attackers have figured out how to bypass these attacks, by defenses, sorry, um, including by, for example, not actually caring where they jump by filling the address space with potential jump targets. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Questions? Okay. So we've talked mostly about overflows that take advantage of things on the stack. But this paper that we talked about, that we assigned for today, baggy balance checking, is much more focused on protecting overflows for dynamic memory allocation. So you call malloc, you overflow the malloc buffer that you got. It turns out that these kinds of bugs are also exploitable. And it's kind of instructive to look at how to, or why they're exploitable. So just to spell this out, um, what you might worry about is that your program has code like this. You have a pointer that allocates 16 bytes of memory, or something like this. And then you overflow this pointer. Maybe you call, for example, get s on this pointer p, and that lets an adversary provide any number of bytes to write past the end of p. So this pointer is not actually on your stack. It's somewhere in your heap. So the question is, well, how bad is it if you overflow some random memory location on the heap? Like maybe you just run into some other random object. How do you know? How do you make an exploit out of this? Well, in all these cases, the way to sort of go after is to like really figure out what is on the heap after you overflow the 16-byte object. And what's usually there is actually some control structures for the memory allocator. So typically, the way a memory allocator works is that there's a notion of sort of an allocation frame, if you will. And that consists of the data that you gave to the application, like the 16-byte region for p. So p over here might point to this data region. But then in addition to the data region, there's a couple of pointers. There's a next pointer and a previous pointer stored just before the data. So when you get a pointer back from malloc, it actually allocated more than 16 bytes. Probably allocated 16 bytes plus two pointers worth of space. And these two pointers are going to be used to keep a doubly linked list of all the memory allocations in the system. And the reason it's needed, it's necessary to keep this doubly linked list is to reclaim the memory once you free it and sort of merge it with the adjacent memory regions that are available or maybe in use right now. And the way this works is that you know the previous pointer, like there's a bunch of memory regions here. So here's one, here's the next one, here's the next one up here. And each one of them has a next pointer and a previous pointer, and so on. So here, let's say the previous pointer is going to point to this region down here. The next pointer is going to point to the next region up there. So what happens when you overflow a buffer on the heap? Well, you're going to overflow up, and you're going to corrupt these next and previous linked list pointers of the memory allocator. So how bad is this? Any guesses? So what would happen if you corrupt these pointers? Yeah? 
Ah, arbitrary memory accesses. So, okay, how come? Well, let's, let's dig into this. So, turns out, what happens is that, well, as usual, I guess, if you just corrupt them with random values, someone will try to access this random pointer and crash. But, like with buffer overflows, let's try to understand who accesses them and what do they do with them. So what's going to happen is that after you corrupt this malloc region and you corrupt the subsequent next and previous pointers, maybe some other code is going to call malloc again. And at that point, what that malloc is going to do is going to choose some region of memory to return as the new allocation, or maybe some other function in the code altogether. But suppose it chooses this region. Suppose this is the region B that this next call to malloc chooses. Well, what this call to malloc is going to do is it's going to remove this from the free list, from the double linked list. So the way you do that is you say the B region that I chose, B.next previous should now be my previous pointer. And similarly, unlink myself from the other direction. Previous arrow next should be B's next. So what this is doing is that this block B that we're allocating after the corruption happened is linked into this list of double linked pointers. And to remove an element from a double linked list, this is what you do. You sort of, you know, point your previous guy to your next guy and point the next guy to your previous guy, and now you're out of the picture. The way to think of this is that these values are controlled by the attacker. In particular, B previous is something that the attacker controls. They wrote this value. So this is totally a choice of the attacker. And so is B next. So what this malloc code is doing is basically choosing one value the attacker supplied and then writing to an offset from that pointer and storing an arbitrary value the attacker supplied there. So this is exactly, you get to choose write this value to this address. It's like a super powerful primitive now that the attacker has access to if they can overflow a heap allocated buffer. So yeah, it's a little bit more involved, of course, because it doesn't get triggered right away on function return. You have to wait until the next malloc call chooses this next memory region to allocate. But once that happens, you will get your value stored somewhere in memory. And you can choose all kinds of values, right? Like you can choose maybe some function pointer and some heap structure. You can choose a function pointer on a stack. You can choose whatever you want. You have to find some address that's worth overriding. Well, that's a pretty powerful primitive. Surely there's some address or some memory location in the program that if you overwrite it, you'll be able to do some damage or run some code. Make sense? Question over here. Do you know which block you're overflowing? Um, well, it's the block at the next memory address. Uh, now, when malloc is going to use it, that's a little bit unclear. It sort of depends on how big this block is, what the next malloc is going to ask for. Is that matching the size of the next allocation request, etc.? cetera? But uh, there's a lot of, sort of much less deterministic or much less predictable exactly when malloc is going to choose this address. Uh, but uh, you have to sort of line up many more ducks in a row, so to say, in order to make this attack fly. But uh, most modern attacks probably look like this rather than buffer overflows these days. I think compilers have gotten pretty good at defeating buffer overflows with canaries, with other techniques. Uh, but heap overflow, many objects are heap allocated. You can easily overflow them. This is pretty much what all attacks do when they find a heap overflow these days. Uh, and it involves thinking harder about how to make it exploitable. All right. But the thing about these heap overflow attacks is that you have to have a, now a different plan for dealing with them. In particular, canaries don't really work. Canaries are good for the stack because we know there's sort of the thing we want to protect, and the buffer is down here, and we can put our canary in the middle. On the heap, this doesn't really work so well. There's some malloc implementations that try to basically put canaries in their structures, like put a canary over here, but not super popular or uh, not super effective, maybe I should say, doesn't defeat against all attacks. Make sense? Any questions? So the next class of defenses I want to talk about are these bounce checking systems that we, uh, I guess, read about in this paper uh, that try to really go against this first step of the attack, which is the overflowing of the buffer.
So could we somehow change the program or change how it executes so that the attacker cannot run past the end of the buffer? And the nice thing about those defenses is that they're going to prevent both stack-based overflows and heap-based overflows. You're just not going to be able to write past the end of the buffer if we can implement a successful bounce checking scheme. Make sense? All right. So how do we implement bounce checking? So the simplest thing to implement is not quite baggy. We'll get to baggy in a bit, but baggy is sort of a slightly sophisticated scheme. The base thing to keep in mind really is a scheme that is called fat pointers. And the idea with fat pointers is that instead of having a single pointer that is just one 32-bit value or a 64-bit value, whatever you want, we're going to add extra information to it. So a pointer isn't going to be just 32 bits anymore. It's going to be 3 times 32 bits. It's going to be the pointer p that we all understand. That's the actual pointer value. And then we're going to have an extra field associated with it called a base and a limit. So this is what every pointer is going to look like in a fat pointer scheme. It's going to be this triplet. And the cool thing about this triplet is that it's going to allow us to check all the operations on pointers to make sure that they happen in bounds, that we don't run past the end of the buffer, regardless of whether it's on the stack or on the heap. So here's the rules. There's basically a couple of operations you have to worry about with these bounce checking schemes. The first is, how do you initialize all this stuff? That's actually pretty straightforward usually. So if you call, for example, malloc, or if you allocate, or if you get a pointer to a stack allocated object that the compiler effectively allocated for you instead of malloc, well, you just set the base and the limit. So base is going to be equal to p. That's where you just allocated. And limit is going to be p plus size. So however many bytes you allocated. Make sense? So these guys are going to track sort of the lowest and the highest range of addresses that this pointer should be referring to. Anything outside of that range, not so great. So then there's really two more operations that we care about supporting. One is that you might actually take a pointer and dereference it. You might read it, you might write it, but sort of in C, you do star P. And what we do here is we check that the pointer is within base and limit. So as long as the pointer is within the bounds, we're good. If the pointer is outside of these bounds, we crash the program. And, you know, it's too bad the program died, but uh, it didn't do anything bad. It didn't allow the attacker to take over. Make sense? And the last part of this bounce checking story is what do we do with pointer arithmetic? So we do something like P or, I don't know, maybe Q equals P plus 5. Well, what we do is we actually do, you know, P changes or the... The, the pointer value changes. Maybe we should call this PTR instead of the P variable. And the pointer changes, but we keep the base and the limit. So what this means is that you can do whatever pointer arithmetic you want. You start out with a pointer. You can add one million to it. You can have a megabyte further down the line pointer. But the base and bounds, the base and limit stay the same. So even though it points way out, you'll not be able to dereference it because this dereference check will fail. Now you could subtract 1 million and bring it back in bounds, then you'll be able to dereference it again. So this is the cool thing. The pointer sort of keeps around with it some information about where it came from and what values are legit, even if you maybe go out of bounds temporarily. That makes sense? Any questions about this fat pointer scheme? So why doesn't this stuff get used? Well, maybe let's look at an example uh, first off, uh, so that we have some understanding of exactly what happens when you use fat pointers. And then we'll sort of try to understand why this might not be such a great uh, practical scheme. So suppose we have p we call malloc of four bytes. 
Well, we get some pointer. It's a triplet. So maybe the address is OX60, and the base is OX60, and the limit is OX64. That's how many bytes you have. At this point, you can dereference P just fine, right? So if you just say, you know, at this point, star P, that's fine. It's within bounds. Now, you could do something else at this point, is maybe you say, well, Q equals P plus 2. That gives you a new val pointer Q, whose value is OX62, and the base and bound are the same, 60 and 64. And at this point, you could store into Q. So you can say Q equals 1, or star Q equals 1. And again, this will work, because 62 is within 60 to 64. Now you can compute more pointers, like R could be Q plus 3. At that point, this creates a pointer R. That thing is 65 now. The base stays the same, 60 and 64. At this point, the program hasn't crashed yet. You have an out-of-bounds pointer, but nothing bad has happened. You haven't tried to write to it or read from it. If you do try to write to it, if you store one to it, that's when the program is going to crash. The runtime is going to say, this is not legal. You're writing out of bounds, terminate the program. But if you don't do this, but instead you do something else, like s equals r minus 5, well, you're going to get a pointer s whose value is back to 60. And the base and bounds are the same. And now you can write to s because it's back in bounds. Now, of course, you haven't couldn't have had this statement, otherwise it would have crashed and that's it. This make sense? So this is bounds checking with fat pointers. This is just looks fantastic, man. Just catch all overflows at all. Done. Can't overflow anything. So how great is the scheme? Yeah? Ah, so your point is bad for performance, yeah. So that is indeed a bit of a problem. So performance could be problematic. One reason why it's problematic is because the compiler is inserting a lot of checks. Every time you do pointer arithmetic, well, actually, I guess for pointer arithmetic, maybe it's not so bad, except that you have to keep copying base and limit somewhere. Maybe not so great. But every time you do reference, you keep doing this check. So indeed, some overhead there could be unfortunate. You got a comment or different? Yeah, so okay, this is CPU overhead, but you're exactly right. Memory overhead as well is like 3x the pointer size. So this is problematic for a couple of reasons. One reason is that if your program has lots of pointers, you need 3x the memory for those pointers. So that seems undesirable. Another reason why this is bad is because many applications for whatever historical reasons, expect to be able to cast a pointer to an integer and back. And we could argue why exactly C has such you know, conventions or semantics that you are able to cast pointers to integers. But in reality, lots of programs stick pointers into integers and take integers and make them back into pointers. And if your pointer is 3x the integer size, well, there's nowhere to go. You can't take a pointer and put it in an integer safely. So that doesn't work. And the last sort of problem with this 3x pointer size is that pointer operations aren't atomic anymore. And this matters on multi-core or multi-threaded programs where before accessing a pointer or updating a pointer was an atomic operation. You could atomically swap from one pointer value to another. But now that it's three memory locations, writing to a pointer or checking or whatever, it's non-atomic. You could erase with another thread and have all kinds of weird behaviors where you saw some intermediate pointer that was not the old pointer or the new pointer. That also causes problems in multi-thread applications. All right? Yeah. So, okay, so the proposal is let's have the compiler fix the casting for us. So the problem is that it's kind of hard to fix because you don't have enough bits to store the information because fundamentally, the pointer could be anything, in some sense, any 32-bit or 64-bit value. You need to cast it to a 32-bit or 64-bit value, but you also need to somehow track this base on the limit. 
In this case, the example looks simple, but in the general case, maybe it's hard to stick it somewhere. Yeah. Ah, so you, you could okay. So you could certainly implement casting to integers and back by saying, ah, if you cast to integer, well, we'll just give you the pointer, and you lose the base and the limit. And indeed, some of these fat pointer schemes basically have to work like this because there's nothing else to do. But the problem now is that for any pointers that casted to an integer, now you've lost the base and the bounds, now you can overflow it. Another problem is that the pointers might no longer be equal in the sense that you might have taken some pointer, cast it to an integer, and cast it back to a pointer. Now the application expects it to be the same pointer, but the base and the limit change, so they're not equal anymore. So if you compare them for equality, maybe it says they're not equal anymore. I don't know, all kinds of messy things start, all kinds of corner cases start, you know, not quite lining up. Uh, it's possible to introduce various heuristics, but never feels quite right. Yeah? Ah, so at what, at what level do you implement something like this? So most fat pointer schemes work at the compiler level, so that when you run GCC, let's say, or whatever compiler implements fat pointers, it is going to generate these triplets for you every time you have a pointer. It's going to insert those checks we talked about up there. So when you, when you have C code like this, it's going to generate these checks in your resulting assembly code. So most of the time it's in compilers. There's some actually funny, well, I don't know, funny or not, there's hardware support for fat pointers on some machines. So there's a research project uh, in the University of Cambridge, for example, called Cherry, that's adding fat pointers and hardware to ARM CPUs. Uh, it's more efficient, gets around some of these problems with integer casting in a weird way uh, with hardware support, but, you know, not every application works <laughs> with these fat pointer schemes. Uh, had a question, yeah? So, okay, your, your question is, ah, you know, that's a juicy value, man. Why don't you just change this somehow? So I think you're, in some sense, right. This value is really important. And if there are some bugs that let you corrupt this, then you'd be in trouble. Um, in general, I think the, at least the logical thinking is, ah, we have fat pointers, so you shouldn't be able to corrupt this because there's nothing you could have overflown to corrupt it. Now, again, not, all, not entirely true, right? Because these fat pointers, notice, work at the level of a whole malloc allocation. So if I allocate a giant structure that has lots of fields in it, that's going to be one malloc. And as a result, I can overflow things within that malloc just fine, because it's within the base and the limit of that malloc. But inside of that malloc, inside of that struct, there could be lots of fields. There could be pointers inside there. And there, if you overflow... If, field inside of a struct and override those fields, then you can mount the kind of attack you're talking about. If you can basically override a pointer inside of some little buffer that is within bounds, and then you can store into that buffer, now you're good to go. So, indeed, right, so it's, the, the thing that this baggy bounds paper points out is that all these bounds checking schemes, including baggy, can only do at best allocation bounds. They can't look at individual struct fields within your data structure, or at least it's prohibitively expensive to do so. And as a result, you, you get most of it offense, but maybe not a, not a hundred percent again. Yeah? Ah, so here's another good point that uh, someone brings up through anonymous questions. Another problem with the scheme is compatibility. Namely, if you have compiled some code with this scheme, and you're expecting pointers to be a triplet, and you call libc, which was compiled without your fat pointers, everything is just going to be very confusing. Libc is expecting one pointer value. You passed in three things. It is looking at the wrong offset. Or if it gives you a pointer, you're expecting one value. Or I guess if it gives you a pointer, you're expecting it to be three values, but it only filled in one. The other two are garbage. You know, nothing good is going to happen. Uh, so this requires the whole world or your entire application, all the code running there, to agree on pointer formats. So you have to recompile all your code with this fat pointer plan in order for this to work. That's another sort of advantage of the experimental support on hardware that I mentioned, that if the hardware implements fat pointers, that sort of 
slightly gets around this issue by having the hardware force it on everything. Uh, but again, you know, you basically have to recompile to this new architecture, which in some ways is the same problem. You have to recompile everything anyway. But, yeah. All right. Make sense? Other questions about fat pointers and how they work? All right. So this is roughly, I think, all the issues that fat pointers have that Baggy is really going after. So Baggy is trying to improve some of the performance problems with fat pointers. To some extent, it really fixes this pointer size explosion problem. And it uh, also largely fixes the compatibility issue. So let's try to understand what's going on in Baggy and how it's going to be able to do much better for us. So Baggy bounce checking. So let's build up to Baggy in a couple of steps to understand what parts of Baggy are doing what for us here. So the starting point is that instead of trying to maintain fat pointers, what we're going to try to have is a bounce table of some sort. So the idea is that when we allocate a piece of memory, like calling malloc of four, we're still going to have a pointer that is exactly one pointer, one 32-bit value, and it's going to point to some memory. So here we have some memory. Here's our four memory locations we just allocated. So that's all well and good. Maybe I should point to the base for consistency in my diagrams. But we're going to somehow store a table on the side that remembers the sizes of all these pointers. So pointers technically are going to be still 32-bit, but we're going to have an extra table on the side that stores all kinds of metadata for us. And we're going to store the same stuff, the base and the limit. And the idea is that somehow we're going to populate this table to go along with the real pointer values here. So you allocate four bytes, you get four bytes of memory, that's your pointer. But you can also look up your pointer in this table. And at least in this naive sketch that I'm presenting, what you're going to do is for every memory address, for every four bytes of memory, you might store the base and the limit. So if that was 60, you would store the base is 60 for all these guys. And the limit is OX64, very much like we had in the previous example with fat pointers. So the idea here is that now we've recovered the single pointer value. And you know this table is gigantic, but we'll fix that in a second. So now we have to figure out how are we going to implement all the operations that we cared about over there on the right. So when we were doing arithmetic on fat pointers, we could just adjust the pointer, keep the base and the bounds the same. So let's see how this might work here. So suppose I have q equals p plus 2. Well, in this case, q is going to point to, I guess I should say, OK, maybe this is OX 60, 61, 62, 63. So when we add 2, the pointer starts pointing here, 62. We don't need to do anything to the table yet, because indeed, we're still in bounds. In fact, when we do this check, we probably should have checked that this was actually a legit thing to do, that we didn't go out of bounds. But in this case, that worked OK. Pointer is 62, and its table entry is this table entry. So this is the table entry for 60, 61, 62, 63, let's say. Ah, we have all the information like we had in fat pointers. So now, what happens if we try to dereference Q, for example? Well, if we dereference Q, no problem. It's a valid pointer. We could, if we wanted to, look up the base and bounds in this table for the pointer Q. We find the base is 60, limit is 64. It's OK to dereference. Same as in fat pointers. Now, the problem shows up when we try to go out of bounds. So in the example on the right, I had r equals q plus 3. That makes r a pointer past the end of the object, pointing somewhere high up. So that's not a good pointer anymore. But can we just let it be represented at OS, OX63 or OX65? So this, this literal value, the pointer is OX60. That's OK. Q is OX62. Is it OK for R to be represented at OX65? Yeah? 
Ah, well, okay, so in the, in the paper scheme, they have a very clever trick for dealing with this, but in my naive scheme, I guess I haven't figured out any cleverness yet, this is going to be kind of weird, because if it's OX65, how do I figure out the base and the bounds for OX65? Well, I could look in the table for whatever it says here. Maybe it's another valid object. So if I just let the pointer R be OX65, if I now look up in this table to see what the bounds for 65 are, Maybe there is an allocation that's legit at 65. And then I'll think that's a legit pointer. So that's not a, not a good plan. So I can't actually represent this out-of-bounds pointer as OX65. So I've got to do something. So in most of these bounds table schemes, they mark it as some kind of an out-of-bounds value that is not dereferenceable. So we'll look at how Baggy does it in a second. But the point is that we can't do quite all the cool stuff that fat pointers could do. Fat pointers can represent everything. But here, we can't represent everything. We don't have enough information. So we have to settle for representing R as some kind of a bad pointer. We don't know exactly what bad pointer is, but it's bad. We can't dereference it. So if we dereference R, that should crash the program. And now, the thing we could try to do is bring it back in bounds like we had on the right. So we could try to say s equals r minus 5. Well, in this case, we might not have enough information to bring it back in bounds. We know that r was some kind of a bad pointer, went out of bounds. But we might not actually know if it was out by 5 or by 3 or by how much. So in at least this naive scheme I'm describing, s might also be out of bounds. We don't know to make how to make it safe or whether it is safe. So this is a tricky situation. Make sense? So these are roughly the sort of at least a sketch of what Baggy is trying to achieve. It's trying to offload the base and the limit into a separate table. But it's a little bit tricky because we need to figure out how to represent out-of-bounds values. That turns out to be the main challenge in terms of functionality. And then in terms of performance, this table is already looking pretty giant on the board. Baggy has some tricks to also make this table much more compact and efficient. Make sense? All right, so let's look at how Baggy is actually going to implement this bound stable plan in a somewhat more sensible way than the naive scheme I described. So the first thing they do is... Uh, they figure out how to make the table much smaller. So here's the, the plan for the baggy version of this table. So the first plan is they're actually only going to allocate with what they call in the paper this buddy allocator, which translates into only allocating powers of two. So what this means is you'll allocate 256 bytes or 512 or 1024, etc but you're not going to allocate any intermediate sizes at all. And the reason they're sort of okay with it is that even though you're allocating maybe more than the application is asking for, and you're only going to check the, whether something is in bounds with respect to this power of two size, it's actually not too bad if you overflow the real malloc object and you go into this power of two buffer because it's just some extra padding belonging to this object. So for them, it's not a big deal if you have extra memory for an object because it's not belonging to anyone else, so you're not corrupting anyone else's data, even though you're overflowing your own object, perhaps. Now, there's, of course, some memory overhead, but uh, that's indeed a cost for them. So that's the sort of one cool thing for them. And the reason they're really excited about allocating powers of two is that it lets them have an extremely succinct way of specifying the size of something. So they're, I guess in this paper, they're targeting a 32-bit machine for the most part. So for all the sizes you could possibly allocate from one byte to two to the 31 bytes, that's only 32 different allocation sizes. And you can represent that in a five-bit value. And in their case, they actually stick it in a single byte, so eight bits. But five bits is enough to describe the size of an allocation now, which is really cool. Uh, really s squeezes down the size of this table in terms of specifying the limit. And the other clever thing, so one, one thing they get out of this is you can describe the size very succinctly. 
The other really clever thing is that if you know the size of something and you know that it's a power of two allocation, you know exactly where the base is. So the way to think of it is that you have your entire address space and you just subdivide it into sort of powers of two. So you divide it in half and half and half and so on. So if you ever find yourself in with a pointer that points somewhere, I don't know, into sub subdivision of size two, and you know, oh, that's the size of my thing, I know I can round down to the nearest multiple of that size, and that's the start of my object. So every object is aligned to a multiple of its own size. That's what you get from allocating everything to be a power of two. So if I have a pointer, and I know the pointer is pointing to something of size 1024, I just round my pointer down to the nearest multiple of 1024, that's what my base is. Same with any other size. So this clever observation means that it suffices to just know the size of an allocation to know both the base and the limit. And moreover, you can stick the size of an allocation to five bits. So that lets them really squeeze down this table. So this table for them is really just these bytes that they have. So for example, if I have an allocation of size 16, I might have the value five in here. Or if I have an allocation of size, uh, maybe, yeah, let's see. Five would be maybe 32 for them. So, yeah, so 32, maybe you'll have some other value in here, seven, that maybe represents something else. Uh, a larger allocation that's maybe 128 bytes, perhaps. So this is all the table is going to store for every byte or every location memory that you care about, they're going to store the size of the allocation that contains that address. So that's the first trick. It's power of two trick. The next trick is they basically have a min allocation size. And they say min allocation size is 16. This is their slot size. And what this now means is that you don't actually have to worry about what is the allocation for every single byte of memory, because you know that every 16 bytes of memory are the same thing, the same object. So you only need one of these table entries for every 16 bytes of memory. So for every 16 bytes of real memory that you might allocate, you're going to need one byte in this table to store how big is the object that you're looking at for that 16 byte slot. That makes sense? And then if you're, you have a pointer, it points into this table, it tells you, ah, you know, this object is of size 2 to the 7. That means that your memory location is uh, some object that is of size uh, 2 to the 7, 128. And that means that you can round down to the nearest multiple of 128 and find the base of your object. So here, maybe it's this guy. That's how you're going to find the base. That make sense? Questions about this? power of two and slot trick for them. All right. So that's half of their sort of cleverness is to really pack in that table. And the other part of their cleverness is to deal with these out-of-bounds pointers. So let's look at how Baggy deals with these out-of-bound pointers. So in Baggy, what they do is, uh, well, let's look at some example. So here we have char star p. Let's say we malloc 64 bytes. So then we'll have a pointer in the table that says the size must be uh, 64, presumably 6. So here we have some element six in the table, right? And uh, I guess we'll have four of them, perhaps. And then if you do some arithmetic, so if you have Q equals P plus 70, now you can't allow this pointer to point into the next element in the table, right? So if naively, let's say this address is OX100, then P plus 70 naively would have been OX146 or something like this, if you just do the math on the pointer itself. 
that points to the next slot. So if you just allow it to be OX146, or maybe the next object, maybe the next object is a bigger object and whatever has sevens in there, now you might be able to overwrite it because it looks like a legit object of another different size. So you need to remember, like we were saying before, this is an out-of-bounds pointer. But we'd like to remember where the out-of-bounds pointer came from. So this is what Baggy does. Instead of storing the literal addition, they flip the high bit on the pointer, so it becomes this. So it's the pointer you would have normally had, except it said the high bit. The effect that this has is that, at least on a 32-bit machine, the upper half of the address space is typically reserved for the OS kernel, so it's not accessible from the application that's running. So if you try to dereference that pointer, you'll crash. The page table says those memory locations are not accessible. So this ensures that dereferencing this out-of-bounds pointer will lead to the program terminating. But the cool thing is that you can sort of figure out where this pointer came from. So if you later have an operation that says r equals q minus 60, for example, and you bring it back in bounds, we can look at this pointer and figure out that, ah, okay, well, it is out of bounds, but we can guess, assuming some rules are going to be followed, that it's actually out of bounds from this object, this thing that had sixes in it, instead of being out of bounds of a later guy, for example. So as long as we can figure out that this is an out of bounds pointer that went forward out of bounds, then we can say, oh, well, if we bring it back in bounds, then first off, this is the object that it refers to. It's an object of a power of 2 to the 6. So subtracting 60, it'll bring it back in bounds. We'll get our value of 1, 0, A, I suppose. So that's how this works. So let's look at these out-of-bounds values a little bit more detailed and understand how Baggy is able to guess which object an out-of-bounds pointer came from. So does this make sense so far? That's sort of the what the plan is, what it's trying to do. Question? Ah, yeah, yeah. So I agree. How, how can you possibly do this? Like, it doesn't always work. So indeed, you're right. So plus 70 would have worked if you do something else, like S equals P plus 500. Baggy cannot represent this. So in fact, if you just do the same trick and you basically do OX800, zero, zero, you know, I don't know, I have trouble doing that much hex math in my head, but you know, something like this. If it was this, you'd be in trouble. You can't guess where the hell this came from. This could have come from a little overflow of OX300, could have been a big overflow of OX100. What the hell's going on? So this is too much. And in this case, if you go out of bounds by too much, Baggy will crash at the time of the arithmetic instead of at the time of a later dereference, just because it can't track it. But the way that it does track these small out of bounds of offsets is that it sort of has a rule that says, who, like, where did you go out of bounds from? So you can sort of think of, here's all the slots that you have in bounds, and here's all the slots you might have out of bounds. So let's imagine this is the slot for OX100, OX110, because slot size is 16 bytes, etc. So here's the addresses that are out of bounds. So here's, let's say, address 8000, 0, 100, etc. And here's the address that we actually got, OX 8000, 0, 1, 46. So that's in this slot. So what's the rule in Baggy? So they basically say that, or the game they have to play is that I have an address that's pointing somewhere here. Here's an out-of-bounds address. It is sort of on the left side of this slot. So clearly it was out of bounds of something. Question is what? So the rule for them is that if it's on the left side of the slot here, then it was out of bounds of this guy. And if it's on the right slot of this, must have been out of bounds of the other guy. Does this make sense? So if an out of bounds pointer is sitting in some slot and it's in the lower half of that slot, it must have been an overflow from the previous slot. So if you want to figure out where this thing overflowed from, you go to a smaller address. That's where it came from. And if you have a pointer that's out of bounds, 
and it's sitting in the upper half of some slot, well, the rule is that must have been an underflow from the next slot over. And these are the only kinds of out-of-bounds they can represent. So what this means is that if I have a legit pointer, I can go out of bounds a little bit past the end, and I'll go into the next slot, and I'll flip the high bit. So I'll be here. So if, I, if I'm doing arithmetic, I'm here, 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 here. When I overflow, I jump here, and I can increment a little bit, half the slot. If I jump into the next slot, then Baggy is going to get confused. I can't increment that far, because then Baggy will think, ah, you're not overflowing this object. Now you're an underflow of the next object. That's just not correct. So if you, if you add more than eight bytes past the end, you panic. And similarly, I can underflow. So if I'm sitting, if I'm a pointer in this object, I can decrement, and I can actually underflow below the end, below the beginning of the object, below base. And I can do it for a little bit, as long as I'm in this half of a slot. So that's how they represent out-of-bounds pointers, is that they assume that the lower half of an overflowed slot is overflowed, and the upper half of an out-of-bounds slot is an underflow. That makes some sense? This is how they're going to recover the original object from an overflowed pointer. And as a result, if we do this arithmetic, when we do when we subtract 60 from Q, what Baggy is going to do is it's going to look at the pointer Q. It's here. It's in the left hand of this slot. This means it must have been an overflow. I can figure out what the original object was by going left and looking at the size of this guy in the table. That guy is a 64-byte object. So now I can figure out that it's legit for me to subtract 60 from it, and I'm going to end up here in this slot, and it's going to be an inbounds pointer because it's now inside the base to the limit. Make sense? Some clever bit twiddling going on here, but uh, question here? Why do they do this? Performance. Oh, like, why do they support these out-of-bound pointers at all? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So one alternative is they could just say, if you have an out-of-bounds pointer, shame on you. We'll crash your program right then and there. And this turns out to be not quite right in this following sense. Uh, a lot of C programs uh, use out, slightly out-of-bounds pointers. So one simple example is that it's fairly natural to write code that maybe allocates some amount of memory, like alloc four bytes, and then you can, in your C code, say end equals p plus four. And you have a pointer to the end of your array. And then you can have a for loop that says for p equals from p all the way to the end, keep doing something. So it's useful in your code to have a representation of the end of your array. But it's an out-of-bounds pointer, even though you're never going to write to it. So it's actually legit in C and fairly common to have pointers that point out-of-bounds. And in correct code, you can compute them but never access them. There's other funny tricks for what applications do with underflowed pointers. So some Fortran programmers like one indexed arrays. So in C, arrays are often zero indexed, or by definition. But Fortran programmers or other sort of developers sometimes might want to have arrays that start with one and go up to n instead of zero to n minus one. So what some programmers do is they say, ah, I'll allocate your memory and set the pointer to minus one. So the pointer is an underflowed pointer, but if you only access it from elements one to n, it will always be fine. You just don't, can't touch zero anymore. So all kinds of weird tricks that applications play in C that require the use of slightly out-of-bounds pointers. And this is why Baggy jumps through all these hoops to try to support them, to make it compatible with existing code so that you can just use it, don't have to rewrite the application. Because if you had to rewrite the application, you could just write it in Rust and be done with this whole mess. Uh, so this is all about compatibility and performance and prevent making some bugs more difficult to exploit. Make sense? All right. So that's probably all I wanted to say about Baggy to you guys. Uh, let's chat on Tuesday about privilege separation. Hey. Yeah.